This is China, the world's second largest economy, home to about a fifth of the human species, and what 2017's conventional wisdom would have told you was the up and coming superpower of the 21st century. Of course, conventional wisdom excels at predicting what was about to happen 20 years ago, and if you made the same prediction in 1997 during the depths of the Asian financial crisis, you'd have seemed both contrarian and incredibly astute. However, if you fast forward five years to 2022, this narrative about China begins to unravel. What began as a series of efforts to advance China's interests and try to mitigate the real systemic problems that had accrued over decades of Communist Party rule has morphed into what can only be described as the national equivalent of a person repeatedly shooting himself in the foot. The nation of China is at war with itself. This conflict is the result of a dichotomy between the country's stated goal, to supplant the United States as the world's preeminent power, and the actual imperative of the ruling party, which is to maintain control of the people and the nation at all costs. While there are some areas where these two goals overlap, it's increasingly clear that they are incompatible on the whole. But before we get into all that, I want to ask two things. The first is that you watch this video all the way through. It might seem like there are parts where I'm just listing problems China has, but I will be tying it all together in the end and coming to some conclusions that, while you may or may not agree with them, might be new to you. The second thing I'd ask is that if you like this video, please consider hitting the like button, and if you want to see more of my content in the future, it would mean a huge amount if you'd subscribe to this channel. With all that out of the way, let's get right into it. Exhibit A, Addicted to Lockdowns. In response to the latest wave of COVID infections, the Chinese government has instituted the most severe lockdowns that the country has seen since the initial Wuhan outbreak. While there are genuine epidemiological reasons to implement some COVID restrictions in China, the images and videos that have been circulated of packed quarantine centers, people being welded into their homes, and thousands of people stuck in dense queues waiting for mandatory daily COVID tests should all raise questions about whether the response to rising COVID cases in mainland China is proportional to the threat. Of course, one way that the Chinese government could mitigate the impact of more recent COVID variants, if it were willing to lose face, would be to purchase and distribute Western mRNA vaccines. However, even discounting that possibility, the question remains, are the benefits being realized by these lockdowns, draconian as they are, worth the costs? The answer to that question is no, and for more reasons than you might think. While the harm done to average Chinese people who are unable to work may be held against their will or might not even be able to feed their families is devastating in and of itself, the long-term costs of this policy are likely to be even higher than those already devastating impacts. Beijing is currently proving that China is not a reliable place in which to do business and that it also can't be relied upon for critical components of the supply chain. China's status as the world's factory was already under threat from nations in Southeast Asia prior to COVID, and after the initial wave of lockdowns, many multinational corporations had already identified the need to diversify their supply chains away from any single country. However, the latest round of lockdowns, their draconian severity, and the disruptions that continue to cause will provoke an even larger exodus of foreign business and capital, a self-inflicted wound that China can ill afford at a time when its other drivers of growth are flagging. Exhibit B, Growth versus Leverage. The Chinese government has long understood that leverage in the economy is too high, particularly among local governments financing infrastructure and throughout the entire housing sector. Taken together, these two sectors account for approximately 35% of China's GDP and likely an even larger portion of the country's year-over-year -year growth. Given that the most obvious and useful infrastructure projects have already been developed over the past 15 years during prior periods of rapid infrastructure spending, and that there is something on the order of 100 million vacant houses currently on the market in China, it should be obvious that the potential for continued growth in these two sectors of the economy is extremely limited. Indeed, for most of the last decade, high-ranking Chinese government officials have paid lip service to the idea of reining in borrowing and switching their economy from dependence upon fixed investment, such as housing and infrastructure, in addition to exports, to an economy which could sustain itself on its own internal consumer demand. However, as the term lip service would suggest, these efforts haven't amounted to much. While exports have declined in terms of their overall proportion of Chinese GDP, the difference has been made up not by consumer spending, but by exactly the fixed investment which has already reached a saturation point in China's economy. What's worse is that these investments, housing and infrastructure, are increasingly being financed with debt. This takes an already bad situation and makes it terrible. Because while building the next bridge to nowhere or the next million vacant homes already results in a net destruction of value and capital, now you have to pay back the cost of those wasteful investments with interest. This takes a very steep opportunity cost. Whatever you could have built instead of the next bridge to nowhere 
and adds a very real dollar cost, or in this case, renminbi cost, on top of it. Worse still is that these types of fixed investments, by their nature, require additional money to be spent over time to maintain them. Now, this is fine if the bridge or houses you're maintaining are being well used in providing effective transportation or shelter to many people. But if these types of investments are already unable to produce enough value to cover the cost of building them, as measured, for example, by the cost of servicing loans, then you're faced with a really stark choice. Either allow this unnecessary fixed investment to fall into disrepair until you're forced to write it down to zero and realize the loss of value on paper, or keep pumping money into maintaining non-productive assets in order to keep the facade of economic growth going a little bit longer. To be clear, we haven't even really reached that point with most of the excess housing and infrastructure in China yet, but the future situation looks increasingly untenable, and that's in part because of the next self-inflicted wound. Exhibit C, Demographic Destruction. If you think that 100 million vacant houses is bad, with every indication that the Chinese government is intent to build more, then consider that by the year 2100, the Chinese population is set to have by some estimates. This means that every vacant house, every bridge to nowhere, every mile of unnecessary high-speed rail is only going to become an even greater liability and present an even greater burden for an economy of 750 million people to maintain than it is for the current economy of 1.5 billion. Oh, and that's before you account for the fact that those 750 million people living in 2100 will be significantly older, on average, than the Chinese population today. Of course, China's demography didn't become this catastrophically bad overnight. It took decades of mismanagement and ill-conceived government policies to get to this point. It all started in 1949 after the communists took control of China. Mao Zedong and the leaders of the Communist Party believed that in order to compete with the Soviet Union, China's population would need to expand rapidly. This policy was pursued until the start of the 1960s, with Chinese people being encouraged to have large families and family planning programs being broadly curtailed in order to boost birth rates. However, following the disastrous and ironically named Great Leap Forward, which resulted in widespread starvation and the deaths of tens of millions of Chinese people between 1958 and 1962, Mao and the other leaders of the party began to worry about how overpopulation would lead to widespread poverty and food insecurity and began aggressively pursuing policies to suppress population growth, such as forced abortions and even involuntary sterilization. By 1980, the government efforts to suppress population growth had been formally codified as the one-child policy, and this would remain in place right up until 2015 when it was replaced by the unimaginatively named two-child policy. That would only make it another six years until 2021 when it was replaced by the, you guessed it, three-child policy. In the short time since then, China has begun to crack down on access to abortions and even deny requests for bisectomies and hysterectomies in a desperate attempt to boost birth rates and forestall demographic collapse. Despite these efforts, China's number of births reached an all-time low in 2020 and did so again in 2021, with the 2022 projections set to fall even further. Tying it all together. All right, so we've established that China faces some truly catastrophic problems. Ongoing lockdowns prompted by their zero COVID policy and ineffective vaccines, the massively leveraged overbuilding of houses and infrastructure in a population that is rapidly aging with no end in sight. And that doesn't even mention the problems of ecological destruction and resource depletion or food and energy insecurity. But beyond saying that in the long term, China is fucked. What is the broader point of all this? What ties all of these things together and helps to explain them? To understand that, we need to break China up into its constituent parts. Those are the people, the nation, the party, which has completely subsumed the apparatus of the state, and the man at the top, General Secretary Xi Jinping. The Chinese government is desperate to have you believe that the people, the nation, and the party are all one and the same, united fully behind the leader. But this is not so. In actual fact, the interests of all of these actors are distinct. The average Chinese person, to the extent that such a person exists, probably wants what average people want in all nations of the world. That is, personal and economic security, sufficient freedom to carry out the fundamental aspects of their lives, and the promise that tomorrow will be better than today both for themselves and for their children. The geopolitical entity that is the nation of China, or Xiongguo in Mandarin, meaning literally middle country, seeks to reassert itself and what it sees as its natural central position within the international order, a position that it lost during the century of humiliation which saw China subjugated by numerous foreign powers. The Chinese Communist Party, or Communist Party of China as they prefer to be called, has the same goal as ever to exert complete control over both the people and the nation by monopolizing all vectors of power, 
They've recently been doing this in more overt ways than at any time in the last 40 years since Deng Xiaoping began to liberalize the country in the 1980s. In fact, a very cynical take on the most recent spate of lockdowns would be to say that their main purpose is not to minimize COVID infections, but rather to habituate the Chinese people to a level of government control that they haven't known for decades. Then, finally, we have Xi Jinping. Xi's goal is very simple, maintain absolute power within the party, or at least as close to absolute as he can get at all costs. Xi has done this to a degree unprecedented since Mao, and he's poised to be elected to a third term as General Secretary of the Communist Party at the time this video is being recorded. Now, these interests are not all mutually exclusive. Improving China's economy, for example, would theoretically improve the interests of the people, increase China's clout within the world, might increase the perceived legitimacy of the Communist Party, and, if she were credited with the success, could increase his standing within the party as well. However, we've reached a point where these shared interests are no longer being pursued. Instead, we're left with a situation in which China's actions seem contradictory and somewhat inexplicable. The government formally acknowledges the pressing need to reduce leverage and switch to a consumer-driven economy, while actually increasing borrowing and spending on the very fixed assets that reduce household consumption. It tries to encourage its people to have more children while simultaneously enforcing lockdowns that destroy small businesses and prevent normal Chinese people from going to work or living their lives. The same lockdowns, which ironically have prompted the government to further build leveraged construction projects in order to boost short-term GDP to meet arbitrary goals set by Beijing. The explanation for all of this comes down to face, a concept which loosely means the same as the English phrase to save face. The Chinese Communist Party, having proclaimed the superiority of its zero-COVID policy over the COVID responses of Western governments, cannot now acknowledge that its policy is completely infeasible in the face of hyper-transmissible COVID variants such as Omicron. To do so would lead people to question both the superiority of their current political system over the alternatives, as well as the sacrifices they've made up to this point in the name of zero-COVID. Likewise, the party cannot fail to meet the economic growth targets set by Beijing. To do so would cause them to lose face, both to the outside world and in the eyes of their people. And the lower level party cadres who are responsible for carrying out these directives have every incentive to lie, cheat, and waste resources in order to prop up the numbers on paper, lest they lose face for their superiors and get passed over for promotions, or worse. And finally, you have Xi Jinping, who has the most to lose and must keep face in the eyes of the people, the party, and the rest of the world. Xi's intent is to install himself as dictator for life with power that is effectively absolute, and like so many people who have attempted this before him, she knows that failure could result in, well, let's call it a very short retirement. For both she and for the party as a whole, to change course would be a tacit admission that something attempted didn't work, and that would invite all sorts of unwanted questions. So the only option for dealing with failed policies is to double down. And this is the real problem with China. Their system of government lacks the ability to even acknowledge, let alone successfully address, the real issues facing the nation and when mistakes are made. To be sure, China's problems are severe, but it's far from the only nation that faces serious problems. The difference, though, is that if you were to ask an American or a citizen from any free nation the question, what's wrong with your country, then whether they're liberal or conservative, young or old, you'd be likely to receive such a long response that you might have to ask them to stop before they finished giving you a piece of their mind. And while the purported problems and solutions might differ dramatically from one person to the next, and might spark heated arguments, the important thing is that these honest conversations are allowed to occur, and that there exists at least the possibility that some of these people might be able to elect officeholders who have real solutions that they're able to enact in order to address their problems. This possibility doesn't exist in China, both because the party maintains an absolute monopoly on power, and also because these types of honest assessments of systemic problems and what needs to change can't occur. The system that comes out of this is one which is overseeing perhaps the greatest destruction of wealth and capital in human history, and also squandering and suppressing the innate potential of 1.5 billion Chinese people. China is one of the world's great civilizations, and the waste of human potential that the Chinese Communist Party has overseen is profoundly sad, a true historic tragedy. But the worst part of all of this is, it didn't have to be this way. Just a hundred miles from China's coastline, we have an alternate model for Chinese civilization. The nation of Taiwan is a bastion of traditional Chinese culture. It's also a vibrant democracy and has an extremely globally important and robust economy, providing around half of the semiconductor manufacturing for the entire planet. 
Pound for pound, this island nation of 23 million is among the most productive societies on earth. And lest anyone accuse this video of being motivated by racial or ethnic malice, as I'm sure many will, I'd point out that Taiwan has a greater proportion of its people who are ethnically Han than the mainland. That makes it a true testament to what Chinese people are capable of. Of course, the existence of Taiwan, as small, vibrant, and wildly successful as it is, begs the question, what if the rest of China had developed in this way? Well, to assess that question in the simplest possible terms, we could take the nominal GDP of Taiwan, 759 billion US dollars produced by a population of about 23 and a half million people, and scale it up to what it would be if the population were 1.5 billion, that of mainland China, which would give us an economy with a nominal GDP of over 48 and a half trillion dollars. That's about two and a half times larger than China's current nominal GDP, and more than twice that of the United States. A Chinese civilization, which had developed in the same way as Taiwan, would be able to truly rival or perhaps even surpass the greatest civilizations of the West. What genius would this civilization have given birth to? What technological wonders could they have achieved? We will never know what this lost potential has robbed from all mankind. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I just have one last note, and that's to say that I've included some links in the description below to other videos and channels that focus on China. I don't intend to make my channel one that specializes in China content, in part because that niche is already so well served by creators who have a lot more experience on the subject and, frankly, put out better content than I can. But China is too big to ignore, so I will be putting out the occasional video on it from time to time. Many of you will already know these two, but for those who don't, I highly recommend the channels Serpent ZA and Lao 86 as well as their joint channel ADV Podcasts for general updates on China. Winston and Matt had collectively spent about two decades living in the country before being forced to flee, and they're two people who I feel I personally owe a lot to, so I hope you'll give them a like and subscribe to their channels if you're not already. Lastly, and many of you will already know this channel as well, Polymatter has put out a series of excellent videos going into much greater detail on many of the issues that I just skimmed over in this one. If you found this video interesting and haven't already done so, I highly recommend that you go to his videos linked in the description below and give them a watch. With that last thing out of the way, I just want to thank everyone again for watching and say, I'll see you next time.